I'm Andrew J. Boyle. Welcome to North by Norway. Here it's the end station for the metro. The tracks meet the buffers. And the road up from Oslo comes to a barrier. Tarmac turns to gravel. The few cars that wander so far from the ring road, well, they're the most determined salmon in the river. But here, their journeys end in a large parking lot between trees drooping with snow. Here, but no further. Nothing inessential has any validity past this point. This is the threshold of the forest, where the orange glow of Oslo fails and the stars stand a chance. Half an hour after the last metro train on the Songsvan line has slid back out of the station, I cross the rails. On the other side is the cycle path, now a snow-covered ski trail leading from the forest perimeter down to the city. I take up my position with my back to the trees. Listen for sounds in the night. Check behind me that some fanatical jogger isn't emerging from the forest trail. Peer ahead down the cycle path that passes the Kringshaw student halls of residence and falls away towards the lights of Oslo. But no one else is out so late. Stillness everywhere. I am alone. I've got skis with me. Now I drop them onto the snow, ski poles also, mittens hanging from the straps. And I take from my anorak pocket the book Idret Argei Langren. Sport is fun cross-country skiing, and open the chapter on the diagonal stride. A picture shows a snow god, from feet to neck, all sausage skin clothing and muscle, from neck to bobble hat, all beard and gutsy Viking attitude. Snow god avoids meeting my timid gaze. Snow God senses my racing pulse. It's my first winter in Norway, my first attempt at skiing. A Norwegian takes it for granted that new arrivals in these latitudes will want to throw themselves into skiing with enthusiastic abandon. I saw it differently. To me, skiing was part of what made Norwegian culture exotic, and I didn't have any plans for learning the Hardanger fiddle either. The pull on me had been the promise of summer hiking in the mountains. It was no more likely, in my mind, that I would learn to ski in Norway than that I would have taken trombone lessons in New Orleans or run barefoot in the highlands of Kenya. Pop your island bubble! You English always take your little cultural bubble with you. There you all sat in your colonial bungalows, looking out at the strange habits of the locals, while Owala passes the cucumber sandwiches and pours the Darjeeling. The young man who fired off this salvo in the communal kitchen on floor 13 of the halls of residence was called Bruce. It entertained Bruce to see me steam and stammer every time he called me an English imperialist. He knew well that I was Scottish and from a working-class family with no stronger bonds to the imperialists than riveting together the ships that carried them to their tea plantations. Bruce had grown up by the ski trails of Vermont. Early in the autumn semester he had proclaimed to fellow foreign students along our corridor that he would make it his mission that winter to teach us all cross-country skiing. 
Now if we overlook a few Norwegians, we were two Brits, two refugees from Vietnam, one from Chile, and a couple of darkly murmuring Turks who never exchanged a word with anyone else. Bruce sketched out how much excitement was in store for me. Just imagine the kick you get when you see a long hill falling away ahead of you. He crouched as if behind a bush, having fallen foul of a bad curry. You quickly adopt an egg shape. Uh, you're in an egg shape? Yeah, that's what it's called. Don't worry about it. You crouch to cut down wind resistance... And you fly down the hill, the trees a blur, the wind sharp on your cheeks. Sounds dangerous. No way! Well, then, think about a clear night, a full moon, and you're all alone, striding out across a frozen lake. He imagined his new friend out on skis in the middle of the night, on thin ice. He had a lot to learn about his new friend. One afternoon. Before the last leaves had fallen from the birches around the nearby Songsvan Lake, Bruce came into my room. Hey, buddy, drop everything and come with me. Uh, how far are we going? Oh, not far. Put your coat down. Not far was right. Out of the corridor, where he forced my feet into a pair of ski boots, mounted them and me on his cross-country skis, and marched me back and forward from one end to the other. A dark passageway, a malevolent aroma of oriental food from the kitchen, and from behind one door the wails of a Turkish pop diva. Bruce managed, nevertheless, to ignite a little flame. I had to admit it. As I click-clacked back and forth, I had my very own tiny Scott and Amundsen fantasy the merest lure of heroism and danger on the eternal ice plateau. Okay, my defences were breached, but I still had no inkling of the fact that, when it came... Winter would so completely obliterate the fallacy that skiing was something I could reasonably leave to the Norwegians at their most exotic. I expected further attacks on my crumbling position, and that it would come from sports enthusiasts like Bruce. But no, it came in the form of a thousand small discoveries, each of them surprisingly Mysterious, beautiful, or peculiar. When winter came, it vanquished me with irresistible poetic force. Before the snow came the cold snap. One bitterly cold morning I was expected at a meeting at the television centre. As I crossed the tram lines at the downtown Mayostuan Junction, I was astonished when a blast of steam was flushed from the underheated switch points where the tram lines meet. The billowing column curled up into the cold air. My route took me past a school where I occasionally watched children playing on a gravel football ground. This bitingly cold morning, they were absent. A man stood there in the overalls of the city's parks department and from a hose attached to the tank on his lorry, he sprayed water across the playground. I stood dumbfounded. It was one of the most unexpected sights I'd seen. A man washing a playground clean, and with the thermometer well into the blue. At the meeting, we all had to wait for the project leader. He had apparently tried to change to his pig deck, only to discover one was punctured. Now, deck, I knew. It was a car tyre. Pig, I queried. Oh, it's winter tyres. You know, with sharp nipples of metal embedded in the rubber to grip the ice. I didn't know. I'd grown up so far from the Arctic, I'd no idea that this sort of James Bond accessory 
was standard winter wear for the car that's going places. The winter enthusiasm of the others around the table had also been tweaked. The conversation spun on topics such as last year's record high to Kanter, the mounds of snow along each pavement amassed by a season of snow ploughing, or the need to get out at lunch to pour Kondensfjärner, condensation remover, into your petrol. Someone was seriously considering leaving the car at home when the first snow fell, and coming to work by Spark, a chair mounted on metal sledge runners. And the snow was expected. There had been warnings on last night's forecast of Kolonnechöring, convoy driving, over the mountain passes. I'd gone to bed in the Norwegian autumn and woken in the first invigorating snap of Norwegian winter. I had plopped out of a wormhole into a new reality where I felt distinctly alien and would be needing the enhanced glossaries of snow and ice. With that first frosty morning and that meeting at the television centre, I knew something unknown and exciting had begun. A fairy tale time, and I had that conviction reinforced as I walked back later that same day towards the station at Majorstuen. I passed the school where the man from the parks department had been hosing down the playground. Dozens of children were now enjoying the first thrill of winter, skating on a newly frozen ice rink. Any typical discussion of winter brought with it the danger of an avalanche of frost-rimmed vocabulary. Pilke, to ice fish. Tele, frozen soil. Nailsbrett, fingernails aching in the cold. Solbear toddy, warm toddy made from blackcurrant juice. The beverage of choice for thawing out a cross-country skier with glassy marbles of frozen snot in his moustache and beard. As the winter progressed, I finally arrived at the outer reaches of exotic vocabulary. The snowy slopes, where seasonal glossaries meet ritual tradition and become simply arcane. I'm talking about winter sports. The only way to grasp a sense of the cultural significance of ski jumping and cross-country skiing was to ally oneself with a native. I'd become friends with a music student called Egil, with whom I had managed to transport back to the student halls an ancient black-and-white television. We'd bought it at a flea market. It must at some time have been the pride and joy of a suburban family, on its robust legs, in a polished mahogany cabinet, and with the screen protected by sliding doors made of mahogany slats. It weighed as much as a washing machine today and getting it on and off city trams and then the train up to Kringshaw demanded fortitude and valour worthy of any Scott or Amundsen expedition. Egil and I would sit in the kitchen and watch ski jumping. He explained Bisha i Bakken, the dog on the slope, which was interval entertainment a dog being tempted by sausages to cross the ski-jumping hill, or hoppe etter virkula, to jump after virkula, the common destiny of any dog's body who is placed in another's shadow, Björn virkula having been an unbeatable ski-jumper. Egil wanted to explain the mysterious K-spot, Hmm, something about the point where the hill flattens out. But to be honest, I think I just blushed and stopped listening. 
And then there was that delicious expression that fell from Norwegian lips during the 4 by 10 kilometer relay race for cross-country skiers. They sipped from their coffee cups, let their eyes glaze over, drew in a long breath, and with a little shake of the head, said, Neidu, stafet, astafet. Well now, relay is relay. For Norwegians are eternally secure in the knowledge that their team saved the best man for the last lap. The complete conquest of my skiing inhibition came as I sat alone in the kitchen on the 13th floor of Kringshaw Halls of Residence. I heard a soft slapping sound outside. Fyup, 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 fyup. I went out onto the kitchen balcony and watched an old man in knickerbockers, his thin white hair blowing behind him, poling his way up the snow-laden cycle path on the far side of the rail tracks. His face was furrowed, but his back was straight and his arms and legs kept a fluent rhythm. The skis must have been masterfully waxed. They glided effortlessly up towards the forest. Next morning, I got myself down to a flea market and bought old wooden skis poles and a pair of ski boots. Then to the bookshop to buy Sport is fun, cross-country skiing. And this was, of course, the wrong order. If I bought the book first and dipped into the chapter on equipment, I would have learned that the flea market skis and poles I'd chosen were ideal for some troll-like giant half a metre taller than myself. Half an hour after the last metro train has left the end station, I cross the rails. Thanks to the gentle slope towards the city lights, I can try to slide a few experimental and highly thrilling metres while looking in the book and trying to adopt a body shape similar to the snow god in the pictures. Oh, it's a fantastic feeling gliding down the prepared ski tracks, and all goes well, until I try to stop. The edges of my skis slip from under me and cross, and suddenly I'm spitting snow and looking up at an unholy knot of legs, planks and poles. He still avoids my gaze, but I know that the dignity of snow god is affronted by repeatedly ending up, crumpled and wet in a snowdrift. There's nothing for it. Both his and my prospects are best served by me having both hands free for polling. I push the book into my jacket pocket again. After a few English expletives, unknown to Nordic snow gods, my poles, my skis and I are all turned about and are facing Nurmarka, the North Forest. The adventure begins. Next time, a little more about my ski adventures but also about Norwegians facing the trauma of vanishing winter. For now, tusen takk for at du hørte på. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.